thank you. That was just so wonderful, and we're just so thrilled that as a, as a local church, we are engaged in these amazing collaborations with other missions organizations and so on. Absolutely brilliant. We're so proud of you, Amy. Thank you so very much for serving and for being available to serve. Maybe, uh, you know, you're going to be called to do something radical for him, going somewhere. You know, we're not, our, our goal isn't to retain everyone and try and keep everyone. You get, you know, we need to start expanding and looking ahead. So it's absolutely wonderful. If you have a Bible, turn with me to uh, Romans, the book of Romans in chapter 6. And while you're getting there... I just want to recommend two outstanding books. There are lots of books on, on Romans, of course. Um, this one is by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. It's called The New Man, because that is what Paul describes in chapter 6, the new person that you are in Christ. If you can get it, buy it. If you see any of these uh, set, buy it. Lloyd-Jones spent over 13 years preaching through the book of Romans, verse by verse by verse. And I have read almost all of those sermons over the years. And if nothing else, even if you can't find this anywhere, search online, MLJ Trust, Romans 6, verse 1, and you'll get his sermon. I'm going to quote from it just now. I would rather you listen to him preaching on those first two verses than listen to me now. It's a better sermon, <laughs> but you've got me. So, but R Lloyd Jones on Romans, absolutely crystal clear, full of strong encouragement that your foundations are secure. And then my copy, I read that one, 1989. This is brand new, it's out this year, Romans by Andrew Ollerton. It's a Bible Society book, and it is more of a devotional journey through the book of Romans. He hits all the right issues in the right way. He's very clear. It's an absolutely outstanding book. You can order it from CBD or from Scripture Union in Rondebosch. Romans, a letter that makes sense of life by Andrew Ollerton. Strongly, strongly recommended. If you forget that, go to YouTube at Jubilee Clough and you'll see me doing this on your screen and you can get the name there. Okay. Here's the question we're looking at today and the answer that Paul gives. If forgiveness is free, if it's certain, why bother about holiness? Yeah, if, if forgiveness is guaranteed, you know, why, why not keep sinning? I've got three points. The first one is, it's the right, wrong question. Or, if you like, it's the wrong, right question. If it's certain, why bother with holiness? You're going to be forgiven anyway. That's the point that Paul's got to. If you're already righteous before God, why bother being righteous in your behavior? So now remember where he's been. You were created by God. God created all things. The majesty of creation is seen through what has been made, and yet we have turned away from God. We've turned to worship created things, Rather than the Creator, we've become futile in our thinking, darkened in our minds, we've turned to sin. As a result, we're cut off from God and we behave badly. But there's a solution. Even though, and it's not the law, chapter two, no one's righteous, not even one. Those without the law, unrighteous. Those who receive the law, still unrighteous. So irreligious, religious, there's none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace, by Christ's death on the cross. It is actually, as we look to Christ and what Christ has done on the cross for us, and as we put our faith in what he has done for us on the cross, that we are declared to be righteous before God. Amazing, amazing. You are made right before God through faith, not through works. Works of the law, good moral works, legalism, none of that gets you right with God. 
You get right with God by believing in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross and in his resurrection is for you. You're justified by faith. Oh, you might say, that's a, that's a new idea. No, says Paul, that was true in the Old Testament as it is true now. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. David was the same. This is not a new teaching. All the Old Testament saints that were right with God were right with God through faith, not through their religious works, not justified by law. And then in chapter five, as we saw the last couple of weeks, if you've been justified by faith, you now have peace with God. He now moves into this assurance phase. He's telling you it's certain, it's secure. You were in Adam, but now you are in Christ. You were under the reign of sin, but now you are under the reign of grace. And therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's absolutely certain. God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Circumstance, this trouble, that storm, this difficulty, that problem, above the earth, on the earth, under the earth, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You've been justified by faith. Your position is absolutely secure. You're safe. You're safe. You're safe. That's the argument. Then he goes on to some other issues about Israel and then working it out a bit later on in the letter. That's the argument. But he kind of breaks in to that argument in chapter six and chapter seven, because there will be people who are hearing this and listening who will be saying, but hold on then, if we're completely right with God through faith in Christ, why, why am I struggling with this little sin and that little sin, and why am I beating myself up? Why don't we just carry on sinning if it's totally assured? He deals with that in chapter six. Who you are has changed, and now your allegiance has changed. So who you are, we're doing this week, your allegiance, you're now a slave of Christ, that's next week. And then in chapter seven, well, what was the law for then? What are all those regulations of this and that, you can't do this, you mustn't do that, and all these kind of sacrificial laws and all these different types of, what was that all about then? And he deals with that in chapter seven. Now, that was to convince you of sin, that was to delineate what sin was and the will of God in that sense, and uh, it condemns you, it makes you realize you're a sinner and you need saving. That's chapter six and seven. So in a sense, they are an interruption into the big theme that he's looking at. So let's start reading in chapters five, verse 20. The law, because the the chapter separations, of course, aren't inspired by God. You know, there's kind of, is that 16th or 17th century? 520 says this, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. A little bit in the sense that do not walk on the grass and you think, why not? I think I will. Nothing happened. You know, don't take cookies from that jar, you say to your child. Anyway, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where, and this is so radical, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. The older versions, where sin abounded, grace superabounded, overabounded. Amazing. So that <clears throat> just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Okay, to Lloyd-Jones. He writes this, we are looking at something that has a very direct connection to the previous chapter. The theme of chapter five is of assurance and certainty of salvation. I'm reading this to you because I know you're not gonna look it up online and, and listen to it. We are, uh, the theme of chapter five is of assurance and certainty of salvation. Our justification guarantees our final salvation in the fullest sense. If we are justified by faith, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We were joined to Adam, we are now joined to Jesus Christ. Because of this one act of the Son of God, you are going to reap all the benefits of salvation. Though the offense did abound, grace did much more abound. And then this other statement that the thing is as certain as this, that we are under the power and the dominion of the reign of grace. 
and that nothing therefore can prevent our final salvation. But here he anticipates a difficulty and he wants to make his meaning absolutely plain and clear. In Christ, we are under the reign of grace. Our future is guaranteed. We have certainty that this wonderful act of justification is an initial move which leads to all the other blessings and guarantees them all. For the moment, however, he pauses. He is not finished with the great theme of chapter five, but he feels that it is necessary that he should stop for a moment and turn aside to deal with an extremely important question. Isn't this teaching going to encourage people to sin? But then there's a second question. Was the law then altogether useless and valueless? Why did God ever give the law to the children of Israel? What was it meant to do? What was its place and function in God's great plan and scheme of redemption? So the apostle pauses at once in his tremendous argument about assurance and about the finality of justification to deal with these two possible difficulties. And that's exactly what he does in chapters six and seven. We can say, therefore, that these two chapters are a kind of parenthesis between chapter five and eight. You know what a parenthesis is? It's when you read something in brackets. So he's, it's not a new subject, he's, it's a digression. He's answering something in, in brackets, a kind of parenthesis. The theme of chapters five and eight is one and the same and is continuous. Chapter eight, you remember, starts with the word, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. That is a link with the end of chapter five, not with the end of chapter seven. Chapter eight begins where chapter five leaves off. Chapters six and seven come in between. Chapter six deals with the first question, then chapter seven deals with the second one, the law. Then after the apostle has dealt with these two questions, he's in a position to take up again the great theme of the finality of justification. I think that's totally right, and it makes perfect sense of Paul's argument. And a lot of confusion comes in because folk don't understand that that's what he's actually doing there. To the question, does this teaching produce this problem that people could say, well, I just carry on in sin, he actually <laughs> says this, if our preaching does not expose us to that misunderstanding, it's because we're not really preaching the gospel. So the gospel is absolutely free. I mean, it's amazing. So it's the wrong but right question. That's what I mean. It's the right question, but no, uh, it's the wrong question as well. The danger is that Christians could know that they're about to do something wrong, but say to themselves, but it's all right though, God will forgive me. Do you remember when Ryan Saville was here, we, he was interviewing some politicians and talking about the, the challenge of being a Christian in the kind of political sphere. And it's a difficult thing. And I, you, know, I, I, you know, you wouldn't like to really, uh, unless you were really called by God, you know, it's kind of the difficult, it's full of landmines. And then one Christian uh, politician was saying how there was a, I don't know if they call it a three-line whip here or whatever it's called here, but the party had said you have to vote for the passing of the abortion act. And she was a Christian. And so this went against her conscience. And I thought, well, I wonder what she did then. Is she gonna get in trouble with the party for this or what's gonna happen? So <laughs> she surprised me because she said, so I decided that I knew that I would vote for the passing of the abortion act and then afterwards I would repent because I knew that God would forgive me. I was like, wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's a difficult one. But before we kind of judge, you know, back to Romans 2, have you done something like that over a lesser thing? You know, there's this challenge that you can rationalize some sin because you know God's gonna forgive you. And the question presents itself if you have properly understood Paul's teaching on the absolute freeness of grace. And he anticipates the problem. And that's why we have Romans chapter six. Why not abuse God's kindness and carry on sinning and live in sin? If grace covers everything forever, why not keep sinning? And he gives the answer and it's a, it's a classic. 
And it's my next point. The answer is, the old you died. That's the kind of question the old you would ask. That's not the kind of question that the new you asks. The old you died, and not only died, was buried, like properly dead, under. Verse two, shall we carry on sinning? He says, by no means. We are, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death. How are you doing today? Dead. How are you feeling today? Dead. Really? I'm buried. Dead and buried. We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we had been united with him, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know, we know that our old self was crucified with him. This is something that you're supposed to know. We're gonna look at it today. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So Paul then, in answer to the question, restates, as he's already actually stated to a degree in the previous chapter five, this massive transfer that took place when you were joined to Christ. He's already said, you used to be in Adam. He was the representative head. And you used to be under the reign of sin but you're not anymore. You are now in Christ, and you are now under a reign of grace. You are under the reign of sin, you have died to sin. You are under the law, you have died to the law. He's very clear about it, black and white, very, very clear. Michael Eaton writes, God's grace is not the kind of grace that leaves us in sin. God's grace is the kind of grace that delivers us from sin. The Christian has died to sin. He's not dying to sin, just as he's not dying to self. Paul is categorical. It's already happened. You died to sin, to its dominion in your life. When the Holy Spirit took you and made you alive together with Christ, he united you with him in his death and in his resurrection. So it's a fact now. You are a reborn child of God. If you're in Christ, if you've believed in Jesus, that is who you are. You are a child of God. The old has gone, the new has come. And you need to start believing that. You need to start believing that. You have been born again. You are righteous before him and you now live under a reign of grace rather than under the tyranny of the law of sin and death. You are not bound to sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. It is not inevitable that when a temptation comes your way that you have to give in. You remember Oscar Wilde's statement, I can resist anything except temptation. That is not the Christian position. Don't get confused about this. Focus on what Paul is actually saying. There's a lot of ink spilt on this because it's like, is that really true? Listen to what the Bible actually, the, what Paul actually teaches here. You are not bound to sin. You are no longer a slave, but you are a beloved child of God. You are a precious son. You're not a servant, you're a son. This is the language 
that is used everywhere. And that's why baptism in water is a declaration of what has happened to you once you've been joined to Christ. The old you died and has been buried with Christ and a new you has been raised with Christ to new life. And therefore, as a confession of that fact, you go down into the water and you come up again as an image of death and resurrection. You don't need to be repeatedly baptized every week, every year, every decade or so. You're not gradually trying to kill off the old man, the old self. Paul declares, we know our old self was crucified with him, full stop. Baptism is a funeral with a resurrection. That's what baptism is. It's, it's a funeral with a resurrection. It's really true. Maybe Paul preaching to first generation Christians in Rome, it was kind of easier because there wouldn't have been many who've been raised in a Christian family and were there, well, I've always believed. But even if you're raised in a Christian family and you've always believed and you've struggled with these things all through your life, you've got to know this. You are a child of God in your inner man. God has done something. You may not have this darkness to light or this old to new kind of grid in your mind, but the, the seed of God that is in you is unconquerable. You are going there. You're safe. You are a child of the living God and you, you gotta start believing it. Hallelujah. He's lifted you out of the ashes and he's made you to sit with princes. He's lifted you out of the miry clay and set your feet on a rock. This is solid stuff. Don't go back to the sand. You're a new creation, believe it. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're not inside, you're not a rotten old sinner. You really are a new creation. You really are. God says it. Paul ah, preaches it's crystal clear. Believe it, believe it. Now we'll come on to, well, what is this problem that I've got then? We'll get to that. I just finished a, a wonderful conversion uh, testimony kind of book. It was brilliant, powerful conversion academic in the US, just you know, absolutely atheist. She got completely gloriously born again and she's publishing and doing fantastic stuff. And the only disappointment was that she said, so when you become a Christian, you, there's a new you, you get a new you, and the old you is like cut back, like a tree stump, right back to a stump, and shoots keep coming through. <laughs> and I thought, oh, it's, it's better than that. It's better than that. The, the tree stump has been properly killed, you know? It's dead. Another illustration that the older preachers used to use was about two dogs. You know, you, there's, two, there's two natures. You've got these two dogs, and which one you feed gets stronger. The dog is dead. That dog died. You, I look, you believe it or you don't believe it. It's up to you. It's up to you. But I'm going with the old self died. That's what I'm going with. I want to feed the new dog, the new dog. <laughs> it's the same kind of idea, though. Paul is not preaching a kind of Jekyll and Hyde spirituality. Which one's it going to be now? Jekyll or Hyde, the good or the bad. So what about these old shoots then? Because they are real. They're coming from somewhere. <coughs> Where are they coming from? Well, temptation is real. This doesn't mean you're, you're dead to sin. Oh, so that, no, it doesn't mean temptation isn't there. Isn't there a battle still? Yes, there's definitely a battle still. He comes to it just now. And the language that he uses, if you stick to what Paul says, is flesh versus spirit. Our mortal body. <coughs> and in some translations, it's not helpful, but the ESV is outstanding on this, very good, and the New American Standard, very good on this. The NIV has changed, I think. I couldn't find the old version. NIV used to have 
sinful nature here for flesh, where Paul says flesh. But Paul's talking about the mortal body. It's the mortal body that is yet to be redeemed. And he's so clear here, the clarity isn't the difficult thing, it's believing it. It's it's like, is this true or not? You know, the clarity is right there. The mortal body, this thing, is still very much with us. This is the battleground of temptation. Paul's emphatic about what's happened to you on the inside. Verse two, we've died to sin. Verse three and four, we were baptized into Christ's death and were buried. Verse five, you don't bury something that's alive. That, that would be, that's a horror film, isn't it? Verse five, we've been united with him in death. Verse six, we know that our old self was crucified with him. And the conclusion, six and seven, we should no longer be slaves of sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. That is emphatic. Five times where the Holy Spirit is telling you the old you has gone. Your parents might say you haven't really changed. Your work colleagues might say you haven't really changed. You might berate yourself. The devil might be accusing you. He's the accuser of the brethren. You haven't really changed. You're not really up to much. You're not doing good. God says, you're my child. You've changed on the inside. You've been born again. You're a new creation. It's happening. But you're still carrying around this this <laughs> carcass. I mean, I, was just, I mean, you look great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but... <laughs> Five times the Holy Spirit is telling you, the old you died. And that's just in this one passage. I mean, it's taught in other places as well. And so our job is to say, okay, I'm gonna mix that with faith. I'm gonna believe this. I'm gonna believe it. (coughs) Excuse me. What is he not saying? What is he not saying? He's not saying you're instantly made perfect. That's the straw man, actually, that those that oppose this teaching use. You no, know, you're not, you're not, he's not saying you're instantly perfect. And now, I mean, there should be a change, but you're not without sin. There's still a sin issue. He's not saying that temptation won't affect you. Of course he's not. John Stott writes, it is not the literal impossibility of sin uh, in believers which Paul is declaring, but the moral incongruity of it. Like it shouldn't be. You shouldn't want to keep on sinning and he quotes J.B. Phillips we have died who have died to sin how could we live in sin any longer he's not saying that you don't have a fight against sin and that you don't have to fight against sin in Colossians 3 5 Paul writes therefore treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality impurity passion evil desire and greed which amounts to idolatry put it to death those sins come Put them to death. Uh, Take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ on the cross. You put them to death. That's not about your old self. That's about sin and temptation that is, is alive in your flesh, where your flesh wants to go that way or that way. And Paul says, don't, put those things to death. He's not saying, let go and let God, which is a teaching that we don't hear really anymore, but it used to be popular at one time. He doesn't say let go and let God and just, it's all, he doesn't kind of, he's not saying it's all grace, you just, just be passive and get fat and just watch the telly. He's, he's, he's saying no, there's a struggle against the world, the flesh and the devil. It's a real battle and he exhorts us not to offer our bodies to sin but to Christ. And as I've said before, he's not suggesting that the gift of righteousness is a kind of magic trick where he, which he uses to make who you really are invisible to him. You know who you really are, but he's done this kind of thing where he doesn't really see who you really are. That's wrong. He sees who you really are, and he says who you really are. You're a child of God. You're the apple of his eye. You're a new creation in Christ. He sees exactly who you are. And you say, yeah, but I, I sinned last week. Okay, you are a child of God who sinned last week. So confess your sin because he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Don't sin because you expect to be forgiven. Don't sin because you, you're a new creation in Christ. That's Paul's argument. It's, it's very, very clear. You are a child of God. Holiness is now innate 
to your new nature. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so holiness is where you're going. You're being transformed from one degree of glory to another as you behold the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing what God has done. So however you decide to interpret for yourself bits of this chapter and the next chapter, your conclusion has to be the same as the Apostle Paul's, which is that you are entirely free from the tyranny of sin. You don't have to sin. You're no longer a slave of sin. Hallelujah. Why? Because my final point, a new you is alive. Just as the old you died, a new you has come into being. Therefore, live like it. That's what he's saying. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, this is the exhortation now. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. Reckon that what is true is true. That's what he's saying. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your where? In your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. That's the application. It's the body. The battlefield is the body. So don't keep offering your body to sin because that's not who you are on the inside. You're now a child of God. You're not dead. You're not under the reign of sin anymore. So don't offer this unredeemed bit of you, this bit that hasn't changed yet, This bit will change, it hasn't changed yet. Stop offering this bit that hasn't yet changed because the bit inside of you, your spirit, your soul, is in this new, you've already got eternal life. You've passed out of condemnation into grace. You're already there. You're seated with with Christ in heavenly places. This body is gonna catch up with you one day. So don't offer this body over here again as though you're still in this category. You're in a completely new category. And what you do with your body matters, and it matters to God. Uh, was I, did I finish the reading? I can't remember. I didn't. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Uh, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. I mean, it's crystal clear. Michael Eaton, again, the rule of sin in our lives comes to an end. By our being united to the Lord Jesus Christ, our relationship to sin came to an end. He was dead and buried. We, when we are united to Jesus by the Holy Spirit, the same thing happens to us. We are dead and buried also. The old me has gone forever. It is not something I want to happen. It is something that has happened. Hallelujah. So in chapter five, Paul describes the assurance of our salvation, our complete confidence, in our position, and he continues the application again in chapter eight. Here in six, he's dealing with the problem of the challenge of ongoing sin in the believer's life. Does it matter? Why not keep on sinning? First, because it's a new you. You changed, you died, you rose. Second, we'll look at this next week because you're now a slave of Christ. Your allegiance has changed. You've changed and your allegiance has changed. You now want to obey Christ. You're now his slave. So how are you doing now you've become a Christian? Well, I'm dead, and I'm buried, and I'm a slave, and I'm loving it. He died, we died with him. 
We must therefore count ourselves or reckon ourselves to be in Christ, dead to sin, alive to God. And he's saying, believe it, live like it. Live like it. You've got power now. You've got access to the Holy Spirit now. You're under the reign of grace. You say, yeah, but it's just, that doesn't seem to describe what I'm actually, my experience, you know, that's, this pull is very real. No, verse 12 again, do not let sin reign in your mortal body and obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as instrument of, of wickedness. But Lord, it's difficult. No, offer yourself to God as, as one who's been brought from death to life. Offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Lord, but it's, it's tough. I, you know, I, I'm pulled here. My flesh, my mortal body wants to go in this direction. No, says, says the Bible, sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. You've died to sin, but sin, sin hasn't died. Sin is still there, crouching at the door. Temptation hasn't gone away. And the ground of the battle is your mortal body, not your old self. Your old self has died. It's the part of you that's still waiting for redemption, the bit that we dress up and make look nice, like the flowers of the field. Your mortal body. It's not just you that's groaning. Cre if you get over 50, maybe. Creation is groaning. Creation itself is also groaning. And so is your body. And you will receive a new body one day. It, as I say, look, you look great now. But you're gonna, it's going to be amazing then. Your new body will be pristine and perfect and amazing and it will be redeemed. You're carrying around in this world a part of you that hasn't yet been transformed by the gospel. The inner you has been transformed, but this, this tent that you use to carry you, the real you around has not yet been transformed or redeemed. Don't get confused. The real you is alive in Christ, enjoying foretastes of heavenly glory by intimate and powerful encounters with the Holy Spirit, by the love of God being poured into your hearts. Have you known that? Times where you're reading the scripture or you're worshiping or something and the love of God is just being poured into you. It's not a small thing, it's not a dribble. It's like a waterfall, a mighty rush of God's love cascading into your inner man. You can experience all of that and then you still go out and you're still in your, you're still in your flesh and someone cuts you off in the car park even. And it's like, oh, no, don't, you know, so this is the tension that we live in. The battle is the flesh versus the spirit. By being joined to Christ, you will definitely get better at living this new life. The same body is on the outside of you, but the inside of you, if we could see the inside of you as you really are, and as God sees you, C.S. Lewis said we'd be tempted to worship. If you could see the inside of someone, what they really are and what they're becoming, you'd be strongly tempted to fall down and worship because you are made in the image of God. And you, the image of God is being restored in you. Hallelujah. I remember, I'm gonna finish with this, a powerful illustration of this. Uh, in a book, I can't remember the title or the author, but so it's not mine. But it was a beautiful illustration, and it was of one of those deep sea divers. You know, you, they go down slowly, and they're connected to oxygen that's above, and then they can go and make discoveries. And he said it like this, it's temporary. He doesn't live down there. That's not where he really lives, but he's got this skin on him, you know, the wetsuit and all, and the flippers and that. He's kind of a bit fishy, looks a bit fishy. His, his skin is fishy, you know. It's like he's, he's, adapting, he's adapted to the environment that he's in. But he's absolutely dependent on this oxygen supply from above. Without that supply, 
he'd, he'd die, he'd be dead in seconds. But who that man is belongs above. Your citizenship is in heaven. We are only here temporarily. You've gotta get that, I've gotta get that. We are only here temporarily. And we're kind of adapted to our environment and this, this flesh is adapted to this environment. But one day, you and I, you are going to emerge on land. You're gonna come out of this fishy, watery, unstable place and you're gonna land on the land, the promised land, the final place. You're gonna be there. You belong there. And you're gonna shed this fishy, flippy, floppy, flapper skin. You're gonna put that to one side and you're gonna receive a new body that's fit for a new heavens and a new earth. It's gonna happen in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trumpet. And then, body, soul, complete redemption. Now we have this watery fight and am I getting enough oxygen and how much do I need to get some more oxygen and I'm splashing around trying to get it right. But then, we're gonna be with him, hallelujah. I think that's a good illustration of what Paul is trying to teach here. The reason we don't live like we used to live down here is because we belong there and we've been changed on the inside. This outer skin has not yet been changed, but it will be changed one day, amen? Hallelujah. Should you carry on sinning then? Grace is free, eternity's secure, definitely going to heaven, carry on sinning, no way, no way, says Paul, why? Because you, the old you, that's the old you, that died, there's a new you. So, love him with all your mind, soul, and strength, and will, and heart, and know who you are in Christ, and live like it, amen? Let's stand together and we'll pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It is amazing to us, Lord. We, uh, we've just come from our own selfishness, sin, and all those responses, and we wanna serve people who are struggling to get their relatives out of broken down homes, and the world's broken down. And here we are, we wanna rescue others as well, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that the word that you've brought to us this morning would work in our hearts and lives. Help us to mix it with faith. Help, it, help us to so receive your word that when the next temptation comes, we say, no, putting that one to death. The next temptation comes along, no, I'm not, no. That's, that, was, that was something the old me would have gone for, but the new me is going for obedience to Jesus. So we pray you'd help us appropriate these things in our lives, that we might live for your glory. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen. hallelujah. Yeah, I think we're done. Thanks, Lex. Guys, church is done, but, or rather the service is done, but church is continuing. I always get that wrong, I always get that wrong. <laughs> but uh, go have some coffee. We will see you again. If you're a member of Jubilee, or you're a leader in leader, see you on th uh, Wednesday at Jubilee OBS for our church meeting. Uh, but today's sermon was just power, it was light, it is a victorious one. We encourage you to go onto Jubilee Clue on YouTube and watch it again. But see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>